you, you interviewed John Bowen on the podcast, I think it was last week, and he essentially did a study of 3,500 successful entrepreneurs, and he designed successful as people that have a, a net worth of over $500 million or more. So these are like the... $500 million. Yes, $500 million or more. Wow. He interviewed that many people who had a net worth I guess, of over $500 I, million. I guess. That's what he said in the podcast. Wow. So that's how you define the, the super rich. And by the way, the reason why I, I'm repeating this is because... I, some interviews I interview like three months before. Yeah, so yeah, I, right. This is kind of a, this is a refresher for me. Okay, okay. cool. So the long, it's, it's, oh yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but he said that he defined the super rich as the five hundred million dollar more. And what he found is that there were there were seven specific principles that were common among all seven of these people. And so I'll just quickly go over them. So number one was they were all committed to extreme wealth. They made the commitment to to one extreme wealth. They um, they, yeah, they, they, they actually wanted it, and they, and they knew how much work it would actually take, and it wasn't going to be easy, obviously. And then, and then, and then thirdly, they, they committed to a, a personal number, and so they weren't just like, I want to be extremely wealthy, and that's it. They're like, I want to be extremely wealthy, and what that means to me is a million dollars. So you said number one, million. number one is commitment to extreme wealth, and yeah. then you said thirdly. So what's number two? Number Sorry, one? those are all in, in, the, in the commitment oh, to extreme wealth. Yeah. got it, got it, got it. I was, right. I was defining. So number one, commitment to extreme wealth. That's personal and quantifiable. Okay. Number two is enlightened self-interest. I, I really like this one. So, well, it's not selfish self-interest where I'm doing a deal with Joe mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm going to do whatever I can to extract and exploit as many resources out of him as possible and then just push him to the wayside when I'm done. So, no, I know what I want. Hey, Joe, what do you want? Do, these align, do, our, do our interests align? Mm -hmm. Let's help each other make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, that's number two, enlightened self-interest. Number three is put yourself in the line of money. And so, if you're listening to this podcast, you're already doing that. Essentially, what he's saying is that, uh, did he get an example on here? He said, so he said, for the people that make $25 million or, or, or more, and this wasn't his specific study, this is something he got from somewhere else, um, 9 out of 10 of them got it through being an entrepreneur, so a business owner, which includes real estate. So if you're listening to this, you're already in the line of, of, of money. Yeah, because even if you're a doctor and you're making, I don't know, four or $500,000 a year or, or more if you're a surgeon or something, Unless you have your own practice and unless you're hiring more people under you and maybe even owned a building, mm -hmm. it's, I don't know how you're going to get to $25 million. Yeah. It's going to take a while, especially with the, the loans and things. So you got, you got to have, you got to be an owner of something. You can't be an employee. Yeah, but he, he said that the, the main point is the equity. You have to have an equity mm -hmm. stake in something. Yeah. That's how you, how you build your, your growth. Number four, and this is another one. They're, these are all very self-explanatory, obviously, but um, pay everyone involved. And so they all hire very talented people, and they and they pay them accordingly versus kind of hiring a ton of different people and trying to like be st stingy and, and pay them on the least amount of money as possible. And he kind of said in there how you know, the, the common stereotype of super wealthy, I'm, I'm not sure if people actually believe this, but this is what he said, that they're like cheap. Mm -hmm. He was like, well, no, they're not cheap. They actually hunt out and find the best talent they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And, this, and pay them a ton of money in order so there's an alignment of, of interests. So number four is not just pay everyone involved, but pay everyone very well who's involved. Yeah. That's the key. Make sure, make sure they're compensated according to the talent level and find the best talent. Exactly. Okay. Number five, various ones still explain your network is your net worth. Your net work is your net worth. And dear dear guys' conversation that, that I'm remembering no, the I think it was was it was it Zig Ziglar. Who's the one that says the five your five your five closest people? Everyone, everyone says that. Okay, everyone <laughs> says that. But he was saying how for for this example, he's not talking about your your five closest best friends. Okay. He's talking about your just just a network of ten to fifty business associates that you can pick up the phone maybe once a month, twice a uh, do a, a bi monthly, and kind of just talk shop, talk business. And see if there's anything new going on in your in your industry or your your world, and there's anything you guys can do together to to grow your net your uh, your net worth together. And so it's not necessarily people you're talking to constantly and you're you're kind of your friends with and knowing a personal lover and getting dinner with. Um, at least that's what, what what he was saying. So it's not the best friend; it's like business associates. Okay. All right. Uh, six is failure refine and refocus. And so what this means is that these these super rich number one aren't afraid to fail. And if they do fail, what he says, they want to fail quickly so that they're able to, to, to essentially refine their, the process that they, that they failed at mm -hmm. and then take out whatever bits and pieces 
they can use that are going to continue to add value to their business, throw out everything else very, very fast so it's not wasting time, and then refocus back on those things that actually actually work. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that falls in line with the 50-50 goals. Exactly. Right, that we talked about yeah. last Friday, where 50% of the goal is reaching your quantifiable objective, and then the other 50%, even if you don't reach that objective, is what insights have you gotten from that experience that will help you in the long run? And as long as we have that second part of the goal, then it's overall a success mm-hmm. because we're able to apply, since we're in this world for the long run, we're able to apply it for the long run and optimize our approach. Uh, and then eventually we'll get that quantifiable, measurable, measurable goal. Yeah. I think I, I think I also talked about um, Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, last week about mm-hmm. his system thinkings. And so he has a book. It's called How to Fail at Everything and Still Succeed or Still Win or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and that's essentially what he talks about. He says how you know he's failed at so many different things in his life, like complete fall on your, flat, your face failure, like losing a ton of money. But he was able to extract out you know, different systems and techniques from those that eventually he was able to actually use all of those from like super really, really random jobs that he did mm-hmm. in order to you know, grow his, his um, you know, writing business and his, his uh, um, cartoon business. So that's really, it's a really funny book because he's a cartoonist. So I'll definitely, I'll definitely recommend uh, reading that. It was, it was good. Um, can I give a stupid example? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, so uh, this past Tuesday of this week, Texas Tech was... Uh, g- going to play Ohio State mm-hmm. in baseball. Te- I went to Texas Tech, uh, Columbus, Ohio, where Ohio State is, is a short drive away, like an hour and a half away from me. Uh, and so I, I saw that they were going to play the game, and I was really pumped up because Texas Tech is ranked number six in the country in baseball this mm-hmm. year, doing phenomenal. Well, I bought the best possible ticket, got ripped off on stuff up by, by far, bought the best possible ticket. The tickets are $11 at the gate. I bought tickets for $45 each because this is a once in a year type of thing. We're right behind the visitor dugout, first row, right behind the Texas Tech dugout. And uh, so I had the tickets. Colleen, my fiance, and I had planned on going. We do the road trip to Columbus, Ohio, dancing the entire way, picking out wedding song or weddings in a month and just enjoying the trip. And then we get there, we get in the hotel, we check in, we go to the bar, have a drink, get something to eat, then we walk to the stadium. And as we're walking up to the stadium and we're we're pumped up, listening to music (laughs) along the way on the walk, and as we're walking to the stadium, there is one car in the parking lot. One car in the parking lot and no players on the field. <laughs> and, and it's 10 minutes before game time. I'm thinking, well, I actually, I don't know what's happening. I can't even think of what's going on. And then we walk up to the gate, the gate office. There's no attendee in the gate office to take our, our expensive tickets. And then, you know, the next thing we do, we, we search on it. The game was canceled. The game was canceled, and I was so disappointed, but immediately oh, my psychology has taught me, well, that's how it is, and let's make the most of our time here. And, you know, Colleen was like, oh, this sucks, <laughs> you know, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, that's okay, that's okay, let's just, we're going to go have fun, we're going we're gonna to go do something else. And uh, talk, so talking about the failing fast, and then you have to just refocus your efforts, I mean, in, in little things like that, that I, I've trained my mind where, mm-hmm. you know what, I was so freaking pumped up about this game, and uh, I'm not going to see it, but that's okay, uh, because that's happened in the past, and now it's time, and we went to a, 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 a bar called 16 Bits and played like NFL Blitz 1999 mm-hmm. and some other things, and then we went to nice dinner, and it was a great night, and we really enjoyed it, and... Uh, that's the type of psychology that is required for business too because mm. what you do in little little instances where there are bumps in the road with something as ridiculous as having a baseball game canceled that you drove to um, to even you know I see it on our so Theo's on the soft, I've recruited Theo to my softball team I'm not very good my <laughs> I pop out every single time <laughs> and and when people uh, just on the softball team 
when something bad happens, if they let it carry over inning after inning, then I know their psychology is weak. And I also know how they apply that psychology to business and their personal life. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you pop up, you are upset initially, and then you immediately start cheering for your teammates. And you immediately start, um, you, you, you start focusing on the next thing that you can do to help contribute to the team. Yeah. And so those are two ridiculous examples. But how we do small things is how we do large things, and I wanted to mention that. Well, I think those are, those are really good examples. It's a, it's a good twist, because again, yeah, you can basically use that on a moment, use this failure refinement focus on like a moment-by-moment -moment basis, because for your, your Texas Tech baseball example, you could have gone there, seen that the game wasn't, wasn't, wasn't being played, and you could have just you know, driven home or just been super upset and angry the entire time and bitter, and then you wouldn't have had the amazing time that you had. Yep. And you still, you know, the next day would have been home and the game would have been over regardless yeah. if you would have gone there or not. And so I think, that's a, I think that's a really, really good example. And also that good, that tidbit at the end of how you do small things is how you do big things is totally true too. And so I'm sure all the best lover listeners can completely relate with that. Cool. So the last one is uh, back to the, the seven uh, principles is to stay focused on extreme wealth. So kind of redundant, it's, it's a play out the first one, which is commit to it. So once you commit to it, you have your, your personal quantifiable number. These, these wealthy individuals don't just forget about it and never focus on it again, right? They've got it up on their, their wall. I'm pointing, for the people listening, I'm pointing at Joe's uh, um, poster board with his goals on it, right? So they continue to, 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 to refocus on their their goals and continue to remind, remind themselves why they're doing it instead of just you know writing it down one single time and then forgetting about it and then maybe at the end of the year going over their goals again like you no know, they, they they look at it constantly and are constantly focusing on it and this guy said that this is kind of the most most important thing and you have to keep number one which is you know your commitment at the top of mind so that you don't forget and don't you know whenever you know things happen like like that you explained and you fail that's the, your goal is kind of what enables you to have the, the mindset and the motivation to refine and refocus. Yep. So I thought all those were, 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 were super interesting. Um, and they all just, they all, they all rang true and they all seem so, so simple as long as you just kind of commit to, to all of them. Uh, one of them I wanted to, I mean, we went into detail. I wanted to go into detail on number six, which we, which we did, but number, um, number two was, What's interesting, um, at least from, from my Which one is it? Oh, sorry, uh, the enlightened self-interest. Because, you know, the, another stereotype, at least from, from my perspective, that I had for the quote-unquote super wealthy is that they were, you know, super selfish and all they cared about was, was money. But once you start to actually you know, get into business, you realize that that just wouldn't, wouldn't work. Like, if you're like that, you're not going to make it very far. Um, God, what's the guy's name? The guy from The Aviator? The, who were they, they oh, Howard Hughes? Yeah, I think uh, that, uh, I think that's what his name was. Uh, I read the, the book by Ryan Holiday, the "Ego Is the Enemy," and he kind of he talked about his story and how um, you know he his his situation was a little bit different because he I think he came into a lot of money. But was explaining like on how his uh, on his on his deathbed, one of his like he was you know, super angry and mad, and one of his his butlers or, or assistants was saying like, you know, "Why are you so mad? Like you've got all this money, like you've got all this this wealth and fame. Like what are you so upset about?" And he goes. He says to the servant, "Like you wouldn't last a day in my like in my shoes, or you couldn't you couldn't last a day in my shoes." And what he meant was that since he was so, um, I guess, so egotistical about it, you know, even though even on the exter externally his his life seemed like it was okay, which again might not even be the case for most people, but he somehow got past that. But internally, he was just a complete mess. Like he just hated himself, hated everyone else, and um, I thought that was that kind of like opened my eyes to it. But then I kind of I met you, and then I saw this. I was like, huh? That, that stereotype is is completely incorrect. And like, yeah, they're they're, they're selfish, but it's not like the selfish you would think about. It. It's like a, it's like an enlightened self interest in a sense of they're they're selfish as long as it helps everyone, you know. Yeah. Um, and I don't I don't ramble here, but one, one other thing, and also, he also said it in the this was what was said in the Scott Adams book I was talking about, and he was talking about how you know you, you uh, how you know you can be selfish or you can be essentially dependent on someone else. And there's a, a third option, but the one that won't true is like if you're not selfish and like taking care of yourself first, then someone else may have to take care of you, yep. which is like not, not 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 a good thing to have, and you're not benefiting anyone. Whereas if you're selfish, in a in a certain sense, like there's an enlightened self interest, and not only are you helping yourself, but you're helping so many more people around you. You're you're you're, you're giving people jobs, and you're giving people you know you know good times, and 
Um, so I, I just want to just say that and see what your thoughts were on that in land self-interest. Yeah, you have to take care of yourself first. Oprah talks about that a lot, how you have to take care of yourself first. Uh, I actually mentioned that to um, one of my team members recently and I said, you have to go on more vacations. <laughs> you, you do. You, you really have to take care of yourself more and do more nice things for yourself because you're constantly doing things for others and eventually if you do too many things for others, you're going to get burned out, you're going to get resentful mm -hmm. and you're going to go the opposite direction. At least for a brief moment and I don't want to be around you when that happens. <laughs> So it's important to take care of ourselves along the way. And, you know, meditation is one thing. I don't do meditation regularly. I do it when I'm in a tough spot, <laughs> but I, I, I don't do it regularly. I, I think I should, but I don't. Um, a book, a really good book is 10% Happier by mm -hmm. Dan Harris. Very, very good book. You gave me that book, right? Yeah. yeah, very, very good book. I read that in like a week. Um, so we do have to take care of ourselves, and we then we can take care of others. Just like the oxygen mask thing, right? On, exactly. on the airplane, you put the os oxygen mask on your own, um, over your own face, and then you put it on the kids. Yeah, and, and I think the biggest takeaway for me was that you shouldn't feel feel guilty for taking care of yourself. You know, because right. because yeah. you could be you could be driven by oh well you know I, I want to go on this vacation but I feel guilty because I have you no know, A B C D to, to do. And so I think that's the hardest part, to not actually feel feel guilty about it. Because mm -hmm. if you actually think about it and sit down and maybe write it out and actually meditate on it and think about it, by you not having your you know, keeping keeping uh, taking care of yourself and thinking about yourself first, you're actually doing more harm in the long run to the people around you so sure. than you would actually actually. That's a, think. that's a huge insight. That's a huge insight. That it's something we have to believe, and when we believe it, then we act on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then ultimately when we, when our, our primary focus in business is, is, um, uh, ha has components that helps others, then the more we take care of ourselves, the better we'll do at whatever we're supposed, whatever we're doing to make money. And if that thing that makes money helps others like this podcast, like buying apartments with investors and sharing in the profits, there are a whole ripple effect of benefits there, then we're able to do more, more good and. A lot of people get caught up with my goal of of having a billion dollars worth of apartment communities by my 40th birthday, which is five years and a month from now. But the reality is that I'm a minimalist. You know, I, I've mentioned this before. I drive a 2012 Toyota Corolla. I mean, I, I, when we buy something, we give something away when, my, when Colleen and I do that. So I, I don't care about stuff. It's about the... Um, the ride along the way that is the ripple effect of a billion dollars worth of apartment communities in all the different areas and levels that that benefits. Uh, and it's, it's just enjoyable as yeah. well. So.